first few, I'll, I'll have a card of like one segment. You'll pick the card, and those are the two you're going to check off on. Your video will have to have all of them on there. But your checkoff will be, you grab these two cards, those are going to have. So is that the April goal? I think I've, I've told everyone to make sure you know that your, um, your lungs go above your clavicles, right? And so one of the positions is your apical. Apical just means on top. And so what you're going to do is percuss that. So that's what we're going to go through today and learn all the segments and then the draining positions for all of those. So has anyone seen a bronchoscopy at the hospital yet? I guess we're doing less because bronchoscopy, you know, is a little more invasive. You're right there in the mouth and going through and looking at the internal part of the lungs. And so sometimes what they'll do is they'll say, they'll get right here and they'll say, where are you? Where are you right here? Carina. Carina. Um, that's an easy one. Don't miss that one. That's the first modification. <laughs> and then it depends. It's amazing to me. They know where they're going. They may be going into the right upper lobe. And so they just, you know, detour off. Once they get past the carina, I, I rarely know where they are. Just because we don't do that all the time. But it's very interesting to see when they do a bronchoscopy, the internal um, pathways and conducting zones and everything. So be ready. If you do see a bronchoscopy, that first thing they're going to ask you is, where are you? And that first one, carina. That's usually the answer. Oh, and next fall, if you love Blackboard, we're going to a different system. Sorry. It'll be Canvas. We're not ever happy with those changes, but I've been through five different grading and platforms here at TCC. This is my 21st year. I started when I was 12, not this old. <laughs> I don't like to think of myself as this old. Thank you. 
talking about is really our percussion. We're, we're creating that vibration. And you're going to have to cup your hands. You can perform it on yourself. But this is for the this is for the Seconds. the right lobe. Right lower lobe. Okay. Okay, right, so now we have a left upper lobe. And then you kinda have some in the left upper lobe that are combined. So the left upper lobe, it doesn't really have a middle lobe. So here you can see it, it's divided four and four. Four in the left upper lobe, and then four in the left lower lobe. So we have four here, four in the left lower lobe. And so there's a couple combined. So here you have the apical and posterior combined. They even made it the same color. Yeah. So you'll have apical, posterior, have your interior. And then kind of what mimics the right middle lobe is the left, it's still in the left upper lobe, but these two segments, superior, which means on top and inferior means below, superior and inferior lingula. Okay. 
superior is on top, again, it doesn't have an equal behind it. And then you're going to have a couple letter combined. You have anterior. Segments. And trust me, writing those down and just kind of thinking about where they are, it'll help you start learning later. You can't breathe. 
take control of the disease, don't let the disease take control of you. And so this is going to make you a more efficient breather. You have a little damage to your lungs, right? See what we need? They have already done the damage. It doesn't cure it. But if they quit smoking, guess what comes back? The mucociliary. Because yeah? as they smoke, it kind of depresses all of that. Right? And so they quit smoking, they'll be like, well, why do I got to quit smoking now? I already did the damage. Well, that's why. You can still keep your lungs clear if you actually do something for your, uh, if you quit smoking. So smoking cessation is big in what we do, a lot of education. Um, if I have a patient call me for PRN treatment, do you ever have a patient call you for a PRN treatment? Oh my gosh, you're... I actually had a lady, she would go smoke. It's when a doctor wrote an order, she could go smoke, and she'd go outside and smoke through her tray, not kidding, you know, those commercials you see, come back in and call me for a breathing treatment. I, and I was so bad at her. Because she'd always wait until I just got some food for lunch or something. <laughs> oh, lady. Um, so I taught her breathing exercises. I had a little argument with her because her doctor ordered that she could smoke. And so I'm talking, this is like 1999. Doesn't feel that long ago, but it's really 20 something years ago. So uh, I was like, no way you did. And no, you can't go back out there and smoke or anything. And you're wearing oxygen, really. Uh, you have to, she had a tray collar. I'm like, no. But she would take it off, she'd go outside, because she smoked like big time smoke. When, and so I had a big argument, and she got really mad at me, and I, I got, I got just let her have it, like, no way. And uh, I looked in the order, and he did order that. Actually, I switched with another therapist, and I never went back in the room again. But um, shockingly, that did say that. I mean, look at airplanes now. You know you're in a new airplane, when it probably didn't have those no smoking stuff. You know what, what pops up there you know so really she if I taught her some of these or even a COPD or a lot of times they'll call you less for a treatment because if you get nervous about your breathing that makes you even more nervous and so what do your airways do so if you have bronchospasm at all it's even going to clamp down even more so breathing exercises something about taking a big deep breath in everybody you ready stretch you're good. Okay. Now pressure your lips. Blow it out. It does feel good. It makes you, your whole body feel a little calmer, right? And so um, these breathing exercises are twofold. For one, it lengthens their expiratory time, and two, breathing like that calming to the, the body. So that's why I always, I don't, it's free. You don't have to have an order, plus they call you less. And sometimes you'll teach it and somebody will be, the patient will say, no one's ever taught me that. Sometimes people still smoke because the doctor didn't tell them to quit smoking. You believe that? That's true. And then as soon as, I, she goes, well, the doctor's never told me to quit. Well, I went right to every doctor that was going in there and say, make sure you say, it's time to quit smoking. You better quit smoking. You, so there was four doctors that went in there that day. The cardiologist pulmonologist, renal, and then their general practitioner. And so all four of them that day told them to quit smoking. And the frustrating part as a therapist is people that have COPD and they still smoke. And so we see them all the time. That's where frequent flyers, they're non-compliant medically because they still smoke and they don't take care of their body. And, and then they're really not that gracious of a patient because they have to fight for every breath. And so they're cranky. You ever have a cranky COPD ear? Almost all of them are. And the reason is they have to fight for every breath. So if you have a cranky patient, it's not because of you, it's because they have to fight for every breath. So take it with a mulligan. I've been yelled at, uh, threatened. I'm like, hey, you don't make me do this. <laughs> uh, but I take that as a challenge. That's a, that almost makes my day more exciting. Like, oh, <laughs> you're a little spry. I like that. But this is what you're going to do because I'm not coming when I get my food and it's hot and you're calling me for a peer entry time. So I kind of put it back on them. So when a patient says, I don't want to do my therapy, if it's for a legit reason, that's okay. But it's easy for a student to say, oh, okay. <laughs> but right now the hospitals get revenue from pro
productivity and from treatments. I wish they would get away from that. I wish they would get away. I wish there was a way where we can say, if we do these other things, education, uh, home care education, telehealth, if we could do that and, and, and use our critical thinking skills in an ICU to get a patient out of the hospital quicker, uh, instead of all these therapies, if we could use our minds to help save the hospital money by getting the patient out, by doing other things, that would be the ultimate goal. Okay, so we're still trying to improve distribution of ventilation. Have you seen the shirt, the t-shirt now, especially with COVID? Uh, what does it say? Face, uh, face down, sats up. That means proning. Right? If you have anybody that's at home that has COVID and have trouble breathing and they've already sent them away from the hospital a few times, right? You ever have anybody call you and say, what do I do? I have COVID and I can't breathe. I have people uh, on my daughter's volleyball team. They're like, oh, my, my, my uh, dad had COVID back in December. He still had not got over it. It's January. They won't accept him back into the hospital. I'm like, well, uh, face down, prone. For six, they do it for 16 hours a day. I hate laying on my stomach, but the distribution of ventilation is a lot better if they lay on their stomach. And we call that proning in the hospital. So. Uh, no, not really asthmatic. It's when they have the pneumonia. Right? Because they get that viral pneumonia with COVID. Okay, so. We're trying to improve distribution of ventilation even by doing the CPT because we can get the secretions out. And then uh, improve cardiopulmonary exercise tolerance, right? We make them a more efficient breather. We're not using all these little small muscles. That's what we're trying to do there. And then there's my analogy, uh, the ketchup bottle, glass, now we've got squeeze bottle, so there it goes. Um, but if you've ever had a jar of anything, you had the hip to get something out, you're jarring the secretions is what you're doing. Uh, we try to hold the position. I don't have time. There's there's 18 lung segments. I can't hold each segment for 15 minutes. I'd be in there forever. And I do that for CPTers. I'm in there for an, at least an hour. I mean, a cystic fibrosis patient. I'll be in that room for an hour. And so the parents are in the room at Cook's. I'm working night shift. And this is my third cystic fibrosis kid in a row. I'm cranking that air down. For one, you breathe better. Do you breathe better in the air conditioning or the heater? Definitely the air conditioning. So people, if you have asthma, that's what I would suggest. Have your room a little colder. Unless they have something that's called, um, it's like, oh, I just lost it. Anyway, from the cold air, right? If they have an extrinsic exacerbation of asthma, like for cold air, then you would want to do that. But, but for the most part, you, you breathe better in the cooler air. So that's what we would do. Um, we'd hold all the positions, and I would concentrate on the most affected areas. And so maybe three minutes on those, and then the most affected area, maybe five minutes. But for your test, you have to know three to 15 minutes. I'm not long. Write that down. How do we do percussion? Now, I always say you always have your hands with you, right? <laughs> but you can't always find a percussor. And so sometimes, uh, it's whatever you have. I do like a percussor, but some of these are like big jackhammer looking things and, and your hands vibrate at the end of it. And so you have to put a, a layer of a towel down because you don't want to go directly on the skin. Uh, you know that little ICU gown? They turn it over and you know why they call it ICU? Um, you want a thin layer like that over it, over the patient, right? You don't want to go directly on their skin. You don't want to go directly over like the clavicle. You do not go percuss right over there. You're not going to percuss over the sternum. Only on the rib cage. Yeah. Yeah. The gown's fine. And yeah. some people are so frail you need to actually a towel. It's but you don't want anything too thick. And so if you're wearing sweatshirts and stuff, for one it's gonna be hot today. <laughs> but for two, dress in layers when you come here for CPT because you're gonna have to percuss on each other. So as soon as, there's only like 20 something slides on this. So as soon as that, we'll go to a bed and I'll show you how to work the bed and put all the positions. And that's what your video will be over. And I think the video helps because you can study at home and then if you ever have to reference it. 
Okay, so we jar them to retain secretions. Um, it's an external vibration to the chest wall, and we can use an electrical. I've had a pneumatic one that I use it on people as well. But I always have my hands there. And for CFs, they like a good hand treatment, uh, like CPT, every other treatment. Then we also have therapy vest, which is nice. But there's something about putting them all in the draining position and a the respiratory therapist doing that. I have a cousin that has cystic fibrosis, and he has CPT four times a day, sometimes even more than that. Um, and so they have to be diligent on doing CPT, otherwise they get retained secretions, pneumonias, and different things. Five feet apart, anybody see that? It is a sad movie. Uh, the book had a really cool picture on there of the lungs and like uh, flowers and tree or something like that. Uh, but now we're six feet apart. <laughs> What it was is they were supposed to be six feet apart in this because cystic fibrosis can pass different bacteria. And some bacteria, if you get it, you won't ever get to have a lung transplant. And so they have to stay six feet apart. Well, she thought, well, I'm going to take, I'm only going to take one foot back. And so the, the name of the movie was Five Feet Apart. They glorify respiratory therapists in there because she did nothing but sit up there and tell them, oh, you better do your treatment. <laughs> I was like, if she has time to sit, you're not a respiratory therapist because, man, they're moving. Um, and my daughter, she's like, I want to be a respiratory therapist. I'm like, really, this is not a good depiction of what you do. <laughs> so, but that's what we're, where are we now? We're six feet apart. And so cystic fibrosis, people have always had to wear a mask around others, right, and other CFs, and, and they have had to be six feet apart. They were ahead of the game. And then that's why we're socially distanced and doing that too. Um, the vibration, again, all that vibration, the whole goal of it is we're trying to get those stagnant secretions to your uh, mucociliary escalator and, and then so they can cough those out. Okay, so an indication, what does that mean? Why would you need CPT? Okay, so difficulty in secretion clearance, if they have greater than 25 to 30 mils a day, nobody ever knows what that is, but if you say, do you know what a shot glass is? Everybody knows that. <laughs> That's about the size of the shot glass, the stuff coming out. If they have an artificial airway and they have difficulty getting the secretions up. If they have an atelectasis due to a mucus plug, remember anything about beyond that mucus plug just goes down. Uh, cystic fibrosis, which is what we talked about. That's a genetic disorder. Uh, bronchiectasis. Bronchiectasis is uh, just stagnant secretions and overproduction of secretions. In a warm, moist environment in your lungs, bacteria haven. So a lot of times they'll have a lot of uh, bacteria. A lot of asthmatics, when they, they, before they were diagnosed with asthma, they were getting pneumonia. And they don't know why. You know why? Because you got adolescents due to mucus plugging. And then beyond that, then we grew some form of pneumonia. That's what happened. Um, a word for body in the airway, sometimes you can jar those uh, loose, not really. I've never, the only time I've, this is one thing I always like to teach because this actually happened and I saw it in a seminar and it actually works. The lady at Home Depot was like, does anyone have any tweezers? Who has tweezers at Home Depot? No, I did not. And I was like, why? And she goes, my son put a peanut up his nose and I can't get it. And the first of all, I'm like, well, I wouldn't. I think you push it back further if you put um, tweezers in somebody's nose, right? And so I just learned this thing, and I go, what side is it on? And she's like, oh, it's on his right side. He's stuck, you know, he's only two. And so he stuck a peanut up there. I don't know why kids stick things in their nose, but they do. And so I said, hey, I saw this. Occlude the left side and act like you're going to give your kid a kiss and blow in their mouth. And she did, and the peanut shot out. Peanut is really one of the worst things you can aspirate because of the oil of the peanut. It causes a real chemical pneumonitis. And so, if you ever babysit or or have any, you know, siblings, kids, or cousins, whatever, that really does work. So just FYI, I always like to pass that on because you think, well, what can you do? That's what you can do. So hopefully it'll save somebody. Someday. All right, so. Uh, compression for operation, um, sometimes we'll give a small bog nub first to, you know, bronchodilator. Who can name a bronchodilator? I'll call it all butter off because everybody gets it. Uh, it's all butter off. Okay, so uh, what does that do? That muscle that's around there, see all this? There were bands. It relaxes it. So if you open the airway and then do CPT, 
tea that's even better. So a lot of times you'll have a bronchodilator first. Um, and then contraindications. So all of those, make sure you know the indications. That is on the test. Contraindications, these are on the test. And so this is contraindication for the positioning, right? So postural drainage positioning. Can everybody go, you know, intradelimer with your head down and your feet up with the bed? No, because sometimes it hurts your head or you have an intracranial pressure that's high before. So that's what this is talking about here, postural drainage contraindication. So intracranial pressure, and that is an absolute contraindication. So if, if they have an intracranial pressure greater than 20 millimeters of mercury, they have a head and neck that's unstable, like before they clear their C-spine, um, active hemoptysis or hemorrhage with hemodynamic, so if they're coughing up blood, probably wouldn't want to do it, or if they have hemodynamic instability. If they're an AFib or anything like that, they might already have, feel it a little bit, right? A little flutter, and then they can't breathe as well sometimes, so. Recent spinal surgery that's not, um, you wouldn't want to put them on all these, and manipulate all these positions. Active hemoptysis, that's coughing up blood, if you didn't know that. Empyema is not even in the lung, right? It's in this, uh, it could be in a pleural space. Uh, bronchopleural fistula, okay, so just a little hole. Could be a TE fistula, and you wouldn't want to do that either. Um, pulmonary edema with congestive heart failure. And a lot of times, they won't have the pulmonary edema because they did come in with pulmonary edema, but then they gave them Lasix, right? And got all that extra fluid out. Uh, large pleural effusion, again, the pleural effusion is in that space. It's not in the lung, you can't get that out. It's in the pleural space. So that's just, Y'all know what a two liter bottle is of soda, right? Oh, the joke is, I know why they call it pop up north now, right? Did anyone leave a Coke? Because in Texas we would call everything Coke. Is it Pepsi? It's Coke. Sprite Coke, right? We don't call it soda and I don't call it pop. But up north I learned why they call it pop because if you left a soda in your car and it was negative one, it pops all in your car. So there, there's where pop came from. You needed to know that. I thought that was interesting. Um, or, so if they have a large pleural effusion, you, that's, I've seen them drain out. A lot of cancer patients might have recurrent pleural effusions, but what I see is that they have not only one liter, two, three, I've seen four liters drained. And you're thinking, if that fluid is there, where's their lung? Right? It kind of pushes it over. I'm like, how are you breathing? And, and they're not breathing well. <laughs> so that's what the large pleural effusion is. And then pulmonary embolism. A pulmonary embolism, and I, you might actually break it loose and that's not a good thing, right? That's in the pulmonary 